All right, let's talk about composition today. This little painting here is Piero della Francesca's The Flagellation of Christ. It has been called the most interesting little painting in the world, and at 23 inches tall and 31 inches wide, it is indeed on the small side for an image with this kind of reputation. Back in my younger years as a graduate student studying Renaissance studies, I'd always hear or read people talk about the Renaissance love of symmetry or geometrically perfect compositions, and I just accepted that characterization as axiomatic. But today, I want to dig into that and actually learn what it means to have a composition built on geometric principles. First, let's look at the content of the painting and identify some characters. It seems to be a painting in two parts. To the left, we have a simple retelling of a biblical scene where it seems Jesus Christ is being whipped while Pontius Pilate watches. Then, to the right, we have some acquaintances of the painter. In the far right, we have Ludovico Gonzaga, the Marquis of Mantua, talking to his friend, the astrologer Ottavio Ubaldini della Carda, the man who commissioned this painting. These men had lost sons prior to the creation of this painting, and the youthful-looking man standing behind them is a representation of this loss. Francesca arranged the figures of this painting to link the suffering of these men to the suffering of Christ in the background, and it works. <sighs> All right, forget that. I just read this piece by Carlo Ginsberg, and it's got me rethinking some things. I just wanted to discuss the composition in this video. The geometry was supposed to be the hard part. The identifying characters was supposed to be easy, but okay. According to Carlo Ginsberg, it's not about the death of the patron's son. Instead, this painting has political messages. Painted in the years that Constantinople was sieged by the Ottoman Empire, this painting is a telling of a story significant to the time period it was painted. The Ottomans conquered the city of Constantinople, the center of Orthodox Christianity, and the Catholic world of Western Europe did very little to help the city. So, in that case, the figure on the right side of the composition represents the Catholic and Orthodox churches standing with an angel between them. Either way, the characters to the left should be easy to identify. The figure being whipped is Jesus Christ, representing the suffering of a Christian Byzantine population during the siege. The man watching this scene would then be Mehmet II, Sultan of the Ottomans, who defeated the Christian city. Or maybe not. Maybe the Byzantines were suffering because of their own leadership. We could then identify the character watching as Byzantine Emperor John VIII. He failed to gain popular support for Constantinople in his plan to unify the Orthodox Church with the Catholic Church during the Council of Florence. So so maybe that's just him watching as Christianity suffers. <sighs> Upon further research, this might not be a political message. I just read a book by Sir John Pope Hennessy. He claims that the actual subject of the painting is the dream of St. Jerome, so I guess let's take it from the top. In that interpretation, on the left side of the painting, we would notice that there is a man with a gilded classical figure above his head. This is a clear reference to a dream that St. Jerome once had and described to his friend. In this dream, St. Jerome was flayed on the order of God due to his love for and constant reading of classical texts. The dude just loved beautiful pre-Christian poetry and then hated himself for it. St. Jerome struggled with his love of classical literature because he found it lyrically more beautiful than the clumsy prose of Christian scripture. So this painting actually represents that struggle. In that case, the figure on the right discussed the relationship between classical and Christian literature. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and just stop my research before I stumble upon a different and competing interpretation, and we're just gonna do this for the whole time. So let's just now pause and go to the geometry. No matter which interpretation we side with, the composition supports it. Jesus is being whipped in the background. The painting is on a two-dimensional surface, but it's of a three-dimensional space. Our eyes need to therefore travel into the painting, into the background, in order to see the suffering of Christ. The suffering of Christ in the background highlights the suffering of the grieving fathers in the foreground during our first reading of the painting. It's the pain of that lost child that sits in the background of their lives, ever present. Relevant to our second reading, the suffering of Christ is ignored in the background as the politicians argue in the foreground. 
A disagreement between two political systems permitted the whipping of Christ in the background. Or in the St. Jerome reading of the painting, he is once again putting the suffering of Christ in the background as he debates the worth of pre-Christian lyrical poetry in the foreground. So composition adds meaning. We should take it seriously. And Francesca was a mathematician, and he definitely took it seriously. To do this right, we'll have to do what geometers do. So let's take the top left corner of the painting and call it point A and label the top right corner of the painting point B. Now we can draw a circle with radius AB and center A. So point A is where you put the stable point of a compass, the center of the circle. And where this circle intersects the bottom edge of the painting, that is a new point. Let's call it point C. We can now draw a vertical line starting at point C to the top edge of the painting following this wall of the building. Where the line intersects the top edge, we can label that point, point D. So now, A, D, C, along with the bottom left corner of the painting, form a square. If we take the midpoints of the lines that define the square and connect them, you'll notice that they intersect directly above Christ's head. Additionally, if we connect points A and C, you'll notice that they follow that beam in the ceiling. So let's call that point above Christ's head in the center of the square, point F. Let's also take some time to reflect on the geometric reason that the two parts of this painting feel so distinct. This square has its own compositional logic. Recognizing this, let's draw another large circle, though smaller than the first, with radius AD, where A continues to be the center of the circle. Because this is a square, it won't intersect with the bottom of the painting until the bottom left corner, but this circle does intersect with lines AC, and the place where they meet is the vanishing point of this painting. I think naming it point V is therefore appropriate. You can also find the vanishing point by following the lines of the tiles if you want. And if you're still not impressed by the way he built this painting, then draw a vertical line starting at point V up to the top of the painting. Call the spot where the line intersects the top of the painting point E, and then play our circle game again. Take line segment AE as the radius of a circle, with A at the center, and you shouldn't be surprised that it intersects with that spot directly above Christ's head, point F. This means that Piero della Francesca purposefully lined up the crown of Christ's head, the vanishing point, and the edge of the white band marking the end of the praetorium to fall on the diagonal of the compositional square that defined the left side of the painting. Though we can debate the meaning of this painting's content and the identity of the figures within it, there can be no debate about how impressive this geometric composition is. So when we say that Renaissance painters liked their geometric harmony, this is what we mean. And I think that's a good place to end this one. If you like this video, please consider subscribing. If you really liked it, you could check out my Patreon, link in the description below. Thank you for watching.